Disney because to me it represents all the things I talk about. Of course, if you've watched that visitor and residence video, you're used to me looking a bit more trimmed and with a bit like slightly smarter. But <laughs> so this is what I look like when I'm working from home. So I don't know where my slides are. What's the easiest way for me to? to yeah, I'll uh, share my screen and uh, put them on and they should be um, there right now. Um, if you can just nod with your head that you see the yeah. black slides or yeah, thanks for the thumbs up. And am I, am I asking you to move slides then? Yeah, I suppose. Okay, old school. All right, can you go to the first slide then? <laughs> yeah, oh. No, it was two. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, lovely. Oh, uh, oi. okay. Which one? No, the fir the fir that first white one with course aims, aims on it. Yeah. Now we're talking. Yeah. Okay. Lovely. So, I think what I think you know what's interesting about the course, and I know that you've already had a kind of a, 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 a week or so to get into it, is is that as I say, it represents a particular. It's it's working on the basis of particular kind of network practices, and everything about it involves having a kind of digital identity. You know, a lot of you've got your videos switched on. We're we're definitely present online. And certainly this Zoom scenario is, is very much a, where the digital becomes kind of a space, where we're all in a space together. We feel quite co-present. And uh, what's important about that is then to consider exactly how do we engage online? How do our students engage online? You know, what are their practices? And, and you know, is there a way that we can get a sense of that, that we can reflect on, that isn't just a collection of technologies? So what this what we're going to do in this session is there's going to be a couple of points where I'm going to ask you to um, to you know ask for your opinions about uh, about a particular question, but we're also going to do the visitor and resident mapping process, which is why hopefully you've got a paper and pen and, and and a mobile phone to take a picture of what we do. So so get ready for that. I'll try and keep the the timing right. So I think what I'm saying is this that what we're going to do in this session is 100% aligned with the philosophy of the course in that sense, okay? Um, uh, oh, I've gone to a next slide here. Can you go to the next slide, please? <laughs> Lovely. So I've, this is a, I think this is a really important starting point, okay? So we can ask ourselves the question, um, it, you know, what's specifically new about digital and about the network? And I think that this is that, that this is that this is um, one of the two things that's really important. Is essentially we've, we've, we're trying to connect everything to everything else. And once everything's connected to everything else, it creates a completely different kind of universe in some senses, and it creates all kinds of scenarios where we can change the mode in which we do things. Okay. So historically, everything wasn't connected to everything else. And to get anything done, you'd have to travel and be in the same physical room. Clearly, we're not doing this now. I mean, imagine the amount of connections that are involved in this particular Zoom scenario here. It's, it's mind bending. So that's the one thing. So I'd say everything's connected to everything else is important to consider. I think the other one is anyone can publish, OK, which historically was definitely not the case. But now anyone can publish, whether anybody will read it or look at it is another question. But we're now in an environment where anyone can publish, whereas a lot of academia is still structured around the principle that only a select few can publish. Now, we could, you could have a discussion about what it means to publish. But the fact is, I could write a tweet and it, if it went crazy, like a good, you know, tens of thousands, if not millions of people could read it. And I don't need to be friends with somebody who owns a printing press or a television studio to get that message out there. And you can see the effect that that's having with people like Trump. You know what I mean? He can literally go round his own government and just talk. So this is huge. Uh, next slide, please. So there's Kevin Kelly, who that quote comes from, he's one of the few futurists that I actually kind of like because he said a lot of things in the early 90s that actually have sort of come to pass. So, you know, generally you can't trust a futurist, but, uh, but I think he's, he's quite safe. So that, that map that we just saw, so if you can go to the first of those, that one there, he does this really interesting internet mapping project. It's an interesting thing to do with students where you literally say, draw a map of the internet as you see it and indicate your home. And I think what's really interesting is we've got all these connections, 
but we everybody visualizes it differently. And so this is one of the reasons why sometimes it's quite difficult to get going in terms of working in a network way, because when you say digital, everybody's thinking of something different. So this one I think of as, this is a 12 year old, I think of this as being the sort of physical infrastructure map of the digital, you know, wires and servers. Can you, can you go to the next one, please? This is the more kind of swirly one. Uh, there's lots of different responses to this. This one is, you know, sort of more how I think about it, this kind of messy knot of stuff. And then perhaps those little blocks are other people, perhaps their web pages, who knows? Can you go to the next one, please? This one is, I feel like that's information. It's almost like there's this massive swathe of information coming through a point and then coming out the other side, maybe. It's really interesting to try and interpret it. Um, but you can, you can already see there are various interpretations of exactly the same question. Whereas if you ask somebody, draw uh, a picture of the building you work in and indicate where you sit, the answers are going to be much more similar, right? People are going to be drawing a lot of squares. Uh, so the next one, please. And then this one, which is like, if you compare that with the first one, it's it's the super extreme other end where the technology's vanished and actually the internet is just a collection of people. And I'd say right now, because this is working really smoothly and I can see lots of people in lots of video windows, you know, we're more up this end of the spectrum in, in, in this session. And I'd say that ONL is more about than it is about wires and computers, right? But the point is, they're all a legitimate answer to the same question. For some people, it's, it's, it's wires. For some people, it's information. For some people, it's people. And all of that, and there's a mix there, right? It's, um, so you, you, need, you need to kind of have that conversation and pick that apart with the people that you're working with because you can't assume that we've got the same image of what's happening so let's go to the next one please oh by the way i don't know I, I, uh, if you there is a chat window yeah if you did want to just uh, drop you know chat in the chat window while i'm talking i'm really happy for people to do that in fact i'd encourage you to do that because it's, it's nice for them to know that you're out there other than the videos and, and if you want to ask any questions or points of clarification, then just drop them in the chat window and I'll do what I can to kind of respond because I'm quite happy to look at more than one thing at once. Yeah, and I can also take a look at the chat window. Yeah, so please, you know, type away if, if anything comes to mind. Uh, I'd really welcome that, actually. I'd, I'd say it's one of the big advantages of working online, not face-to-face. -face. Um, so, the, this I find this this diagram quite useful. It is indicative that all educationalists are obsessed with triangles. Okay, you'll find that the more that you read, they love triangles. Okay. Um, but and I think the reason that I put this in here is because I'm interested in in the identity and practices bit of the digital. You know, which is a bit like being interested in the it's people, not technology bit of it. But I need to be really clear to say that you can't talk about that stuff unless you've responded to access and awareness and skills, right? So I've got an enormous amount of respect for all layers in this triangle. Like if the Wi-Fi didn't work, we wouldn't be having a discussion about digital identity. We'd just be not doing anything. What's useful though, I think, is to not imagine that this is a ladder. It's a bit like Bloom's taxonomy, if you know of that. It's, it's not a strict ladder. It's not, it's not as if you get access and awareness, then you get a whole stack of skills and then you get a whole set of practices and then you have an identity. Actually, people are always traveling up and down this in different ways. So from a student point of view, you know, the students might have a really good sense of their own social identity in digital spaces, but have almost no idea how to use any of the educational systems or the university systems, right? So it's not, it's not a straight stack to the top. We're always looping around. Okay, next slide, please. So I just want to very quickly talk about this because I mentioned students and I wanted to talk about this digital natives um, idea, which is an idea that Mark Prensky sort of proposed around about 2000 and it was really popular. But rather than talk about it, um, talk at you, if we go to the next slide, um, uh, 
is there can you chuck that into the chat window for me so what I want you to do is to um, jump to that link if you can that's a digital whiteboard and I'd like you to respond to that what do we mean by digital native question what do you think digital native means on the whiteboard and I'll just give you a couple of two or three minutes to find your way to the whiteboard and to kind of answer that question no right or wrong answers whatever comes to mind and I'm gonna find my way there as well which means exiting from school So people are arriving now. So what do we mean by digital native? Or what do we think it's come to mean? However you want to in interpret that. Uh, you can grab, oh, they're all appearing, lovely. Yeah, so it's working, that's good. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so we've got someone who grew up with access to the internet. That's interesting, isn't it? Because that means that means I'm a digital native, just kind of. Fe some feeling comfortable in D digital. We've got some good scrolling as well. I do like a bit of whiteboard scrolling. Um, technology comes naturally like a first language. Now that that's uh, that's very astute. <laughs> Um, because actually that's kind of how that metaphor of immigrant, immigrant and native actually plays out. Effortless we've got there. There's somebody brave enough to attempt to handwrite, which I admire. Yeah, there's loads of stuff coming in in the, in the, in the kind of chat window as well as on the board. Yeah, so you've got, you've got my niece using a, a cell phone and making pictures when she was two years old. The whiteboard's struggling a little bit, but I'm seeing stuff. The generation that knows both how computer works and how to use them, born when computers were new enough. Yeah, I see where you're going with that. There's also some really good square boxes and circles as well. I'd, I'd love these whiteboards. They're so messy. There's something, there's something delightfully untidy about them. Yeah, I, and there's like, I wanted to write something. I, that reminds me, I'm gonna write it down. Digital mess. I think that should be a subject. Um, okay, the white, because somebody scrawled an absolutely huge line down at the bottom, everything's become tiny and up to the top left. But I think we've got enough to go on. That is brilliant. What I'm gonna do is I'm, I'm, I'm gonna put my screen back to Zoom and I'll just respond to some of those things that have come in. So yeah, digital natives um, is, it is that that I'll pick up on that language point okay so it, it is genuinely the, the principle behind it is like the first and second language principle it's a metaphor of language and so the idea is that if you've grown up with digital technology around you then you end up um, kind of getting into it in, in a way that's a bit like speaking your first language so you, you have that kind of fluency and if you're an adult when the digital technology appears, then you might find your way into it, but it'll always be a bit like you're speaking your second language. Okay, so you could become incredibly fluent, but it's never quite the same thing. Now, the, the, uh, this, this idea became enormously popular in quite uh, a dangerous way, okay? So, can you go to the next slide, actually, please? Sure. Yeah, because what happens i think this is the quickest way of kind of critiquing that idea is that what happened in universities is we saw students coming onto campus or whatever with really decent phones and nice laptops or we kind of knew that they had thousands of facebook friends or that they were very active in social media and we confused we confused the the fact that they owned these technologies with with the various capabilities that are involved. So the simplest way of putting it is, you know, having 500 Facebook friends doesn't mean that you suddenly become good at the process of academic research. Seems obvious, but in some ways, the way that we actually responded in universities is almost on that basis. So what happened with the digital natives and immigrants idea is that it, it, it basically became 
old people don't understand technology, but the kids do. And therefore, we don't have to help the kids because they kind of got it. And we confuse the, the technology with the practices. So there's a practice which is called research, which isn't to do with technology. And then there's a whole load of technologies that you may or may not be good at. Right. Being good at the technology isn't the same as being good at research. And I'm sure you've got loads of examples of that. Can you go to the next slide, please? So I actually had an argument with um, it was an argument. Yeah, I, I should have said I was on a, in a panel discussion with Mark Prinsky, but I just, who came up with that idea. And there's a there's a blog post there that you can find your way to. And the problem with that discussion was it was le it was less about the digital natives idea, but it was just intriguing to me because Mark Prinsky would characterize university as something very, very, a version of university that comes from films and from 50 years ago, and then said, here's why it's wrong and therefore we need to. At which point I went, but what you just said isn't what universities are, so I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> and, it, and it got pretty heated. So there's a video of that, it's quite fun to watch. But ultimately, um, the point is that we, that there's not really any such thing as a digital native. There, is, there are just people who are good at doing certain things because they have a reason to be good at it, okay? So the example that I tend to use is, if somebody's grandkids move from the UK to Australia, then those grandparents suddenly get good at using because they have a motivation to engage, right? Can we go to the next slide? So this is just, so I've just picked um, some little bits out of a bit of institutional research that we did um, at my university a few years ago. And what you can see there is, you know, these, these are our students, they'll be between 18 and, and 22 or whatever generally. And you can see that they're, they're I think the 25% were mildly anxious and didn't feel ready to share their work online is interesting. You know. I'm reading some of your blog posts, and I know that this is quite often the case. You know that anxiety you feel in ONL when, when you're asked to, hey, just blog your ideas. You know our students feel the same. In fact, on a lot of these things, our students feel the same as we do. And it's not a bad assumption to run from. You know, it's like, it would what I'm asking my students do make me feel anxious? Is a good question to ask because if the answer is yes, then they'll feel anxious. <laughs> It doesn't mean it isn't something you should do. Um, and certainly that, that percentage, 32% are, are overwhelmed by the information they receive. I'd say that's probably gone up now in the last few years. So we're all dealing with the same problem. So in that sense, the natives, native and immigrant idea doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily helpful. I'm not saying that there aren't generational shifts, but I'm just saying that in that way, it's not helpful. Let's go to the next slide, please. So, uh, yeah, so somebody's, I've just responded to the chat. I think, you know, even simple and common tools like Microsoft Word, young students are not very good at it, even if they are gamers or social media users. Exactly, right? Because Word isn't simple. Word's crazy, right? And it relies on you knowing a lot of practice that's to do with constructing documents. Like, what's a font? Leading, kerning, paragraph breaks. What do they have? They have like, you can have a page break, you can have a style break. You, it, it, you know, it's, it's really, it's a really very, very specific set of practices. It's not easy. It's a, it's a thing, right? <laughs> it's a thing you have to learn. You don't get born knowing how to write a Word document. Just the same way you don't get born knowing how to write a good essay. But Depending on our own experiences, we imagine certain things are simple or not. They're not simple. We're just used to. So what? So what I did was, um, yeah. And if you do learn about what, well, oh man, I don't want to get distracted by this. But honestly, when my kids were at primary school, I literally said, "Why are you not teaching my children how to type? They're going to spend half their life typing." And it's because in the UK, historically, you teach the girls to type because they would be become secretaries and in the typing pool and you wouldn't teach the boys, <laughs> okay? I worry that we're still working on that basis. It's crazy. Anyway, I, um, yeah, so some people have it and some people don't. 
it's uneven. So in response to that natives and immigrants idea, I came up with this visitor and residence idea. You've watched the video. I'm not going to go into it in great detail. Can we go to the next slide, please? I think this session is a good example of this, but it's just an idea that's used all over the world because people have found it helpful. Um, and the, the key thing about it is that it's about motivation to engage, not about technical skill. Okay. And I think that's why it's helpful. So let's go to the next slide. Sorry, I, I, I'm pushing you around from a distance, but it's working. Um, so No problem at all. <laughs> so you, you've seen the video. I, I will just review it very, very quickly, but I'm going to do the quick version, and hopefully we're all right. Um, I can't quite remember the video. I made it a little while ago, but um, you know, it's a continuum. It's not two types of people. Uh, we all engage with things online in visitor mode and to a certain extent in resident mode. You know, it's always a mix, okay? Um, and I think one useful, th there's a few useful things to think about is that the extreme end of residency tends to be super, super visible. So for me, it's tweeting because you, you can Google to those tweets or you used to be able to Google to them, but they're completely open to the whole world, right? So that's the extreme end of, of, of residency. Let's go to the next slide. So I'm just going to explain either end of the continuum, even though it's a sliding scale. So I don't want you to think of it as two boxes. It is a sliding scale, but I'll just explain this in. So visitor mode, a good way of thinking about it, it's like a series of tools. You might have watched me sort of mend my own bike <laughs> in the video. Um, and I think what's important about that is that it's quite, it's quite instrumental. You've got a thing that you know you want to do. And what's really important is you don't leave a social trace you do leave a data trace. I think in the last few years, we've become much, much more aware that we're leaving a data trace and our students are aware of that and it's worth considering. You don't leave a social trace. Um, let's go to the next slide. Yeah, temporary residence and permanent residence, yes. I think people, uh, just responding to that comment in the chat, I think there, there are people who live out more of their life online than others. And I feel like during the virus, we're probably going to live out more of our lives online than physically. <laughs> Certainly a colleague of mine who's in Hong Kong, who's already been quarantined for like two months, his, he, he, he's more resident online than he is face to face by a long way. Right. So, another, it, yeah. Sorry, just another question in the chat. Oh, uh, web one and web two somewhat yeah they they do they do i'd say you know generally speaking it's going to be those web 2.0 type technologies that I, th I think what happened was web 2.0 came along social media came along and it suddenly put this 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 social resident sort of people layer on top of all of the tools that used to be there so what's happening is that you know in web one, you'd say, well, perhaps the internet was a collection of tools and a bit of discussion forums, bulletin boards. And then with web two, suddenly the web became, had this whole extra layer of places and spaces. So in resident mode, we're thinking of the web as a series of places and it's, it's the easiest way of thinking about that is where you're co-present with another person. So if you remember that last, map from Kevin Kelly with just the, all the smiley faces you know the point is your your motivation to go online is to be around and connected to other people and you will leave a social trace okay and um, yeah the artifacts or digital relations is a really interesting question I think I can answer that let's go to the next slide um, I'll go through this slide and then I, I can get to that actually because it is a good it's a really good question so um, what's useful I think what's useful to know is that there's a lot of activity in the middle of the continuum that's within closed groups and communities I mean that's what this is right now you know this is not open to the whole world but it's definitely resident and most people's social media present has an edge right uh, when I tweet it sort of has an edge because of the people I follow me but it sort of doesn't have an edge because anybody could find those tweets and that's what is sort of messing with the world is how that is, is that sudden shift. And there are several people in anonymous. Yeah, you can be an anonymous resident. And, and I think the thing is you can leave a social trace, but it might not be your primary identity. It might be an anonymous identity, but it's still connected to a person. 
if you like. Okay, next slide. So what we do is we add, uh, then we add context to it. So context is really, really important because the way that we engage changes radically based on what is kind of a social context rather than geographical context. It used to be that social and geographical context were kind of aligned. So when I was at home, I was my home person. And when I was at work, I was my work person. Well, I'm working from home right now. So, you know, that's all collapsed, which is really interesting. But nevertheless, I'm in work mode now. So that's a person. So that's an institutional context. And later on this evening, I'm going to have a beer and that and I'm going to go downstairs, have a beer and it'll be a personal context. Right. So you can see how that plays out online. You know, a lot of our students are very confident online in a personal context, but actually really anxious in an institutional context or in a course context. And we need to recognize that's a big shift. So coming back to that idea of artifacts or digital relations, I'd say it's both. So when I tweet, it's to connect with people, but that tweet is also an artifact, right? If I post a YouTube video, then people get a sense of who I am, but it's just an artifact. If I leave the comments open and people start commenting and I comment back, then it's a relation, right? So I think there's a really interesting question you can ask, which is what's the difference between a person and a piece of content? And I think that that's really blending now, right? Uh, and I, I like that. I think that's healthy. I think for too long in the academia, we pretended that the content that we traditionally produce, I'm talking about like academic papers, wasn't anything to do with a person in theory. It's, a, you know, it's that idea of writing in the third person as if you're not a person. But the truth is, the reason you choose to read uh, an academic paper is as much to do with who's authored it as it is to do with what they've written. So I think what's happening is we're just getting a bit more honest about the idea that, that you know, content is a person, a person is content, and we're connecting those ideas together. One of the reasons we're connecting them together because it really plays into the, to the business model of social media as well. Can we go to the next slide? I'm about to ask you to do this, okay? This is my digital, this is my visitor resident map. Well, a kind of version of it because it's changing all the time. I'm going to speak to this just for a second and then I'm going to ask you to create your own on a piece of paper and upload it to a Padlet. So stand by. Um, so just to very quickly just go through a couple of things here so you get a sense of it. Um, uh, this is my neat map, right? You're going to make horrible scrolling. This is a diagram that I've been working on here, right? That's what, that's what it actually looks like when I draw things. So this is a cheat, this one. <laughs> Um, so my Twitter's right over at the resident because if you ask if you if you ask the question where can I find Dave White online the answer is usually Twitter okay and it's and it's spread between the institutional and the personal because for the most part I'm tweeting professional things but occasionally I'll tweet something personal and then my mum rings me up and talks to me about it because I don't ring her up enough uh, my blog I blog and it's all, and it's very much my opinion so it's you know, it's about me, it's connected to me. The blog is, it, the title of the blog is my name, like your O&L blogs are very much like this. So this, so that's a very resident practice, but it's very institutional in my case. And then you can look at things like email personal up in the top left, which is very personal, but I'm just not chatting in email. That's the way that I am. So it's just administrative. So it's, it's very visitory. Plenty of people that use email are really resident in email because they're much more social and you think, well, where do I find this person? It's in email. So where you map a technology is going to be different depending on how you engage with it. Okay. Now I'm hoping at this stage, because you, you know, you've, you, you've seen the video and all the rest of it, that you guys are happy to just uh, plow on and uh, make a kind of draft version of your own visitor resident map. Can we go to the next slide? And then, can, can you, actually I can do it, because um, why not? I, I'm gonna copy and paste the Padlet in to the chat window so you can click through to it. Now when you get to the Padlet, you will find that there are already maps in there. I don't want you to let that bother you. It was just interesting because that Padlet is actually from the, we used that in the last session. What I'd like you to do now is to just spend five, six minutes drawing your map and then take a picture of it and chuck it into that padlet 
um, there's no wrong answers with the with the with the mapping. Okay, um, and you can do squares, circles, triangles. You can use colors. You can interpret it in whichever way you see fit. The key thing is the kind of the difference between resident modes and, and visitor modes. So I'm going to talk a little bit less for a while, so that you can concentrate on having a go at scrolling your map. If you have any questions about the process, yes. Right, yes, that's because of the way that I use Facebook. I'm completely antisocial. I use it like a rubbish address list. I never, never respond to anybody. I'm, I lurk, if you like. Yeah, do you want to go back a, a, a frame so that people can see my map? Don't let my map prejudice how you make your map. If you, if you go to the Padlet, you will see a lot of maps already. Yeah, that might, that might be enough inspiration. So you can you I mean if you want to use digital means to draw a map then then sure um, that's fine too but um, a quick scroll on a piece of paper is is fine and what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a look at the Padlet for myself. Do you still see the your slide or what do you see now on the screen? I just see the slide with the Padlet URL on it. Yeah, good. Thanks. I think that the maps will stack in from the top, so it should be obvious who, which ones are the new ones. How do you upload your, yeah, uh, exactly. Take a picture with your mobile phone of your drawing and then upload it. So you're probably going to need to find your way to that URL on your mobile, which might be a little bit fiddly. Depends how you can zoom. We're not in a, we're not in a terrible rush here. No. Right. Well, who's going to be who's going to be first into a Padlet upload? Competition always works, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, is that pad? I'm just checking. Is that Padlet available for creating new things in? That's the one thing I didn't check. No, uh, we can. People check. can chuck stuff into it, can't they? I think so. Uh, I think I am unable to post any picture. Pressing on it and that. And... Yeah, I wonder why. Oh, it, it's yours, isn't it, Jorg? Uh, yeah, I can't checking there if... either. You might just have to take, change the editing rights on it. That's Did interesting. We, where do we where do we change the, wait a second? We'll get there, don't worry. Yeah. While you're is having a look at that, I mean you've got your maps ready to go. Um I will um 
just talk about how the mapping works. I hope people have found that a relatively straightforward process. Sometimes there's different questions that come up. Um, it, I've done that with teaching staff before. I've done it with people in libraries, I've done it with students quite a lot. And what I find is, and this is what we'll do in a second when, we've, when, when some maps, when we're in a position to see some maps, um, is that the, the map is it just a useful way of generating conversation. So when people compare their maps, they'll, they'll be like, well, why have you put that there? It's a bit like the question I got between about Facebook and Twitter, you know, is why have you put that there and I put it here? Or why is that institutional? Now? I didn't think we used that like that. And what tends to happen is the conversation moves from the technology to the practices, to the kind of philosophy almost of, of, of how people are engaging online. So it's quite, it's a useful way of, um, it kind of facilitates a really useful discussion about around people's digital practices and their expectations. I think it's quite a useful thing to do with a new set of students, especially if you're going to work online with them quite a lot, because it gets a lot of stuff that would otherwise be sort of a tacit assumption into the room and you can have that conversation uh is it just is that padlet just a bit kind of stuck yeah i simply don't know if where i would share it or change the setting to uh... Well, I'm wondering, York, if, if you've got, if you've got oh, visitors a, can read visitors change there. private. Oh, now um, public uh, visitors can. I don't no. think you, you shouldn't need to log in if we set it up right. Perhaps we yeah. locked it after the last session. Are you sure you want to discard them and close this? No, you have unsaved changes. <laughs> Keep working. It's interesting that there's this discussion about visitors. That, that, that metaphor appears quite often. And add post, edit and approve others post. Can, can write. You can and start from modify. So Icons wait a second. Uh, now, uh, now it should be um, hopefully. Yeah, there's a little plus has appeared. That's the one. So if you refresh the Padlet, there's a little plus in the bottom right, or you can, I think you just click on the screen. Yeah, yeah. So um, have a go at chucking some of your maps in. We've still got time, so that's fine. Yeah. Um, and then we'll have a little chat about them. And then I've got a couple of other things just to kind of, kind of wrap up, which I can go through. Uh, yeah, no. So now everyone should see a red plus in the lower right hand side. Yeah, I think I'm seeing new ones coming in quite quickly now. Yeah, excellent. Hey. Yes, yes. Oh, now we're talking. Oh, look at these flying in here. Okay, whilst you're uploading, I'm going to pick. Uh, can we share? Can you share the Padlet into the Zoom, please? Is it coming in? Yeah, yeah. If you can open that up so it's sort of full screen in Zoom. Yeah, and just. Uh, so we only lost a couple of minutes to that. That's fine. Yeah. Ha, ha. <laughs> no. There. Oh, that looks better. We're getting there. Yeah. Do you see the map that says my map and it's got a little slidey on it, top left? Can you open that up full screen, sort of bigger? One second. Yeah, you're getting there. And oh, it's there. moving around pretty quickly. That one there, yeah. Okay. So I know a lot of you will be uploading and all the rest of it. I don't know whose map that is. Is it something that you, if you're happy to, then jump on the mic and and say hi. Hi, it just, it's hello. Clarissa. It's my map. Lovely. Hello, Clarissa. I just thought you, it was it jumped out at me because you've got this pointy bit on WhatsApp, Telegram, Signal, where it kind of drops off as you move towards the institutional. Is that because you'll very occasionally be talking about work, but you'd like to try and keep it personal? No, it's more like um, I have, I rarely have um, pers um, contact on WhatsApp with my work colleagues, but sometimes on 
important days or when there's a big meeting or something something then i use it there but it's very rarely yeah that makes sense yeah that's and you've got cloud storage which is in your resident institutional quadrant so really it seems to me that a lot of the way that that your work operates is just by sharing files with each other that's yes the mode and so it's quite interesting when I started doing these maps, quite often that quadrant was almost completely empty and just had a bit of email in it. Uh, and it's not unusual for that quadrant to be quite empty. Um, so it seems like you'll, the, that's quite a formal way of being resident and institutional, which is fine. So thank you. Um, let's go to another map, Jorg. So what have we got here? Let's do that top left one that's got, no, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, no, that's good. That's great. Okay, whose is this map? Did you want to um, jump on the mic? And if you don't, that's fine. So I, I'll just talk to this, and if you appear, then you appear. That's fine. You can see here you've got the Moodle LMS or VLE, Office 365, Microsoft Teams. That would be, that looks very similar to my institution. So you can, you know, Generally speaking, what ends up in resident institutional tends to be the kind of officially provided platforms. And what we find when we do this with students is that they only ever, the only things that tend to appear in resident and institutional are the things they've been asked to engage with by the institution, if you like. So this is, to me, this is a really classic map in the, in the sense of there's a, very, there's a very clear distinction between the, 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 the kind of character of the technology and where it's ended up. So, you know, who uses Microsoft Teams personally? That would be unusual. It might go that way. And then there's a blogging over there, which I, I'm not sure what that might mean, but that's interesting. Maybe that you, maybe you blog about a hobby or a club or an activity or something like that. Maybe it's to do with work, it's difficult to say. But as you can see, there's another example of Facebook being visitor, not resident. And I think that's important to note is that, you know, the technology doesn't mandate where and the, the technology doesn't mandate the mode of interaction. You can be visitory in technology that looks residenty, and vice versa. So there will be maps in here where email is surprisingly resident. Let's do, should we just do one more and then we'll move on? I hope that you, I mean, you can flick through these yourselves. Um, let's, do, let's do that one that's in the middle. It's got a big Facebook blob in the middle. So in a so in in a longer workshop, you can spend longer discussing with each other about your maps and what you think they mean. And I think that process is really useful. If you want to get on the mic, if this is yours, then do. Hi. Hello, who's this? Harris. Hello, Harris. Um, so it looks like you've got an intriguingly resident institutional Twitter. Are you running an account for a course or a library or something like that? Yeah. Yeah, I mainly use it for um, an institute that I work with. There you go. Okay. And then the blog, which is ONL. So as you can see, there's a classic example of, of uh, a piece of practice appearing because it was kind of pedagogically part of the structure of a course. Um, and then talk to me about Facebook. It seems to me that you've got complete convergence there where Facebook's just everything. When you log into Facebook, anything could be happening in any context. Is it just a giant chaos like that <laughs> I mean I use it I mean quite a few um, groups uh, for work um, so we I, I use that to share information and to find out information so it can be kind of a little bit resident when I'm talking maybe about what I'm doing and sharing sharing stuff but I also go in there to kind of um, find resources for teaching or research um, and then the same a little bit with the more um, with the personal uh, mode. Um, I also, I'm, I don't think I'm very much resident in Facebook anymore, but I am sometimes quite uh, yeah. involved in something and other times I just go in there and find out stuff. Yeah, and I think it's useful to note that a lot of the platforms we use like Facebook aren't a single platform. They're actually lots of different things under a big umbrella and there are lots of different modes of interaction. So for, for example, I know a lot of people that just use Facebook Messenger. Um, so, you know, it, 
historically, sometimes institutions have done surveys of students where they've asked students if they've got a Facebook profile. Well, if they say yes, you still don't really know what they're doing, which is where some of these, like, where you need to be more nuanced. So again, Facebook wants to be your whole world. And so offers you that opportunity, but you can actually use it in lots of different ways. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I think what I'm going to do is um, move on from this little section. This is amazing. There's so many maps in here. This is great. Uh, I'm just going to I'm just going to indulge just for a second. Have a little scroll through. Yeah. Oh, somebody using colours there. You can't see how I'm scrolling, but that's fine. So I hope you found that helpful process. If you're still making a map or uploading, then do do that during the session or after the session because this, this then becomes the Padlet then becomes a kind of resource for the course. And it it's, you know, the blogging your reflections about why your map is the shape it is, or that kind of um or what you found helpful or unhelpful about the process itself is a really is quite a useful thing to do as well. That you know, a map can be quite a useful little core to a to a a blog post. So I just got a couple of things that I want to go through. I've lost the slides on screen just for a second there. So if you could find a way of bringing them back up. Man, I'm asking you to do a lot. Let's go to the next slide. So I, I just want to put some real broad thoughts into your head towards the end of the session. So you've got the visitor and resident stuff. There's something really practical you can do with that. I think it's really useful to convene that discussion with the people that you're working with and the students that you work with. I think what we're looking at here is a shift between hierarchy and network, hierarchical ways of thinking and working and networked ways of thinking and working. But what's interesting is that institutions, especially universities, are are both, but the but they're, they're they are hierarchical and also anything that involves assessment or awarding marks is necessarily hierarchical, okay? And we need to recognize that as institutions, that's what we do. We rank students, we, we credentialize and all of those kind of things. And there's a lot of positives to that. Whereas something like ONL, the way that we're working at the moment, and the way that we spend a lot of our lives now is actually in this real network connected way. And so it's, it's um, the point is not, to try and shift everything from hierarchy to network. The point is to find the sweet spot where you're getting the best out of both of those, okay? And I think sometimes when it comes to forms of network learning, the real crunch point comes at that kind of assessment point in, in the structure, you know? And we get, and you get that as well if you're a teacher, sometimes that's really difficult because you might say, hey, you know, I don't wanna be the boss of you, we're like co-learners, I'm just a slightly more expert other, but I'm also going to decide whether you fail. <laughs> so, you know, it's a trick, it, we're in that, it's a tricky balance. So let's, let's, um, let's go to the next slide. Um, if you, in theory terms, in terms of educational theory, and this might be something that you're interested to look into, really, you know, constructivism maps onto hierarchical modes quite well, and connectivism maps onto network modes. So if you're looking for a theory that makes sense of how we can respond to these networked uh, modes or networked opportunities, connectivism is great. It comes with a health warning. Connectivism is utterly impossible in its purest form, okay? But it's something that you, we can definitely work towards. Um, and as I say, that you know, these things never exist in a vacuum. So even in the most connectivist environments, um, the person running, like right now, okay, we're in a pretty connectivist environment in some ways. The way we did the visitor and residence thing, that was quite connective. Nevertheless, I'm still the guy with the power because I'm talking, right? So there are aspects of what we're doing here that are massively networked, but in terms of the way, pedagogically, you could argue actually, this is pretty hierarchical, right? The whiteboard was perhaps a moment that was less hierarchical, but I was the only guy with the mic. So, you know, we have to be really careful how we think about this stuff. Your, what I'd like to do is just plow through all of the, the slides until we get to the one that is the decaf one. So there's tons of them. 
and it's not it's not because I'd expect to go through this many slides. Uh, it's just there in there. You you you've got these slides. Um, uh, you can you can um, distribute them amongst yourselves. There's loads of different maps in there, which sort of have different flavors that you can go through. They're quite interesting. But just to round up, I wanted to point you to the digital creative attributes framework, which is like our institutional response to a lot of this. So we've got a creative attributes framework, which are those kind of big, you know, productivity, enterprise, agility. Um, and then what I've added, what we've added is a whole load of digital practices to them. So, you know, we could, the mapping's really great to have that broad discussion, but then you've still got to say, well, what am I going to learn? Having done the map, what do, what do I want to learn next? You know, what practices, what modes of engagement do I want to become more expert or more confident or more fluent in? This is a kind of institutional framework that responds to that because it sort of lists off those practices and it allows you to say, you know what, actually, I think we're probably all interested in these three practices. Let's talk about how we can learn them together or, or improve on them together. So it just moves you from kind of broad discussion towards more something that feels a bit more like curriculum, maybe. Um, OK, next slide. I just I, I want to finish on this quote from George Siemens because I find it really useful and really positive. And I think that this idea, now that knowledge and networks are abundant, not scarce, the emphasis should be on connections, okay? So this is, this is like the, the, the mirror to that Kevin Kelly quote, which is, you know, what we're trying to, and he wrote that in 97, you know. What we're trying to do is we're trying to connect everything to everything else, for better or worse. What's the effect of that? Knowledge and networks are abundant. What, how, what, so what, you could say? Well, for George, the so what is, it's about connections, okay? And we teachers are the arbiter of connections. Now, that's quite a radical statement if you think about the recent history of education or the last 50 years of education. You know, it's always worth remembering that, that historically, we the teachers were the gatekeepers of authentic knowledge is what would you normally see written there, right? Historically. So the idea that we're arbiters of connections because of the networked environment, I think that's really reflected in the way ONL works. Um, I think it's a really difficult thing to do because even in the most fluid courses, the community wants somebody to be the high priest, right? I've not got a problem with that, but it happens. Um, but I, I just wanted to leave you with that thought because I think it's I think it's a really useful you know it's just a really useful one sentence concept which you can just keep coming back to if that's the case and we're the arbiter of connection what should we be doing what does what does that mean our teaching should look like and what does that mean our institution should look like and how can we engage our students in that mode so I'm going to leave you with that. Last slide is just my, is just my um, contact details, but that's fine. You can you can chuck around. It's, it's fine. You know where I am. You know where to find me. You've seen my VNR map. Um, so that's me. Thank you very much for engaging with that. I, th I think I think we got there. Can I just say, just for the record, um, this is the only bit of teaching that I haven't been worried about because of the virus, because it's already online, <laughs> and that's quite a big deal. <laughs> And thank you so much for joining us in the course, Dave. It was very uh, awesome to have you with us. Very thought-provoking. I think there's a lot of thinking we can do uh, with what you left us here. And uh, yeah, everyone, any one of us who was on Twitter, you might have uh, seen Dave's twi Twitter handle there as well. Um, uh, or talking about Twitter, you will also join us, Dave, next week for the tweet chat right yes that's right yes um i should have been better prepared to chuck in the date here um so but maybe someone is on the onl homepage and has the date readily available in the chat um so um if you've never experienced a tweet chat then i highly recommend to do it in a safe setting of onl and uh, that will be the only tweet chat uh, for the course and but there's plenty of tweet chats which you could join later then um which we will uh, let you know uh, in the community um 
other options but it's yeah w would be lovely to have you there as well thanks for the great turnout and um so um hope corona does not make you too um stressed out um hopefully we have a lot of conversations about network and other forms of online education at our institutions and within the course so uh, thanks everyone for joining thanks, thanks everyone. again dave and see you online soon yes brilliant cheers bye everyone bye